Welcome back to another video about temporal GNNs. This time we will talk about the PyTorch implementation for a traffic forecasting dataset. There is a library called PyTorch Geometric Temporal which is an add-on to PyTorch Geometric and provides several recurrent GNN layers. So first I wanted to say a few words about this library. The library offers three data structures that can be used to store graphs that change over time. This has efficiency reasons, for example for static graphs with temporal signals it's sufficient to store the graph structure once and only update the node or edge features. The underlying data representation is based on PyTorch Geometrics data object. So if you plan to build your own data set you basically need to build a PyTorch Geometric data set. I've also uploaded a video for that plus you need to pass it to one of these graph iterators. Another component of the library is a temporal signal split, which can be applied to one of these data iterators. It's a straightforward test-drain split that considers the temporal dependence in the data. A third component are several temporal GNN layers that follow the same design patterns as PyTorch Geometric. At this point there are around 28 different layer types available. Last but not least, the library comes with a couple of datasets that can be used for testing. One of these is a traffic forecasting dataset that we will use for this video. Now let's jump into the code and train some temporal GNN models. So this is the notebook, I've shared the link in the video description. The first step is of course to get PyTorch Geometric. And after that we can install PyTorch Geometric Temporal, which can be achieved by these couple of pip installs. I don't know why, but for me this took quite some time, so you might need to be patient here. In the end of such cells I typically call clear output to keep the notebook clean. After the installation was successful, we can have a look at the dataset. It is called MatterLA and contains measurements of information collected by 207 sensors. These measurements take place every 5 minutes and were collected somewhere in 2012 in Los Angeles. This dataset was published with the paper DCRNN, so Diffusion Convolutional Recurrent Neural Network, and it is included in PyTorch Geometric Temporal and can be obtained using this MetroLA dataset loader. First we need to instantiate this data loader and then we call the getDataset function on it. This iterator is a static graph temporal signal iterator because we have a static road network underneath and the information of each of the sensors changes over time, that's why this second component is temporal but the first one is static. You might have already seen these arguments num time steps in and num time steps out. In order to fully understand those we first need to talk about some time series forecasting basics. Handling time series data can be challenging sometimes. There are different ways how you can use temporal data to perform predictions. Let's say we have this sequence of six measurements. The most intuitive way to perform predictions is to collect a sequence of past measurements and use it to predict the next time step. In this example you have a sliding window of size 3 so you always look back 3 time steps and use the information to predict the next one. The labels are highlighted with yellow and the input features are blue. In our example, so in our dataset, the features and the labels are both the traffic speed. This is a special thing about time series forecasting because the labels will become features for the next time steps. So after the next iteration we move on with this sliding window, look back three time steps and predict the next one. Of course the blue inputs can also hold additional information, in our case it is additionally the time of the day. We can of course also visualize that for our traffic data set Let's say these are the speed measurements of a sensor in 5 minute intervals. Then we make a cut at a specific point and ask the model how will the traffic conditions evolve in the next 5 minutes. Of course 5 minutes is not really sufficient and therefore the next possibility is to predict several time steps into the future. Here we would have a total window size of 6 of which 
three measurements are the historical data points and the other three ones are the labels. This would allow us to predict further into the future, in this case 15 minutes. Again, we can also visualize that for a specific sensor, so we use the historical information in order to predict several time steps into the future. I will talk about some more details in a few minutes when we create the model. So I hope this gave you a rough overview on some time series stuff. If you need more information, I can highly recommend TensorFlow's introduction to time series forecasting, which I will link below. Based on what I've shown right now, these two arguments, num time steps in and num time steps out, should make sense now. They simply mean we use a sequence of 12 samples to predict 12 time steps into the future. And that corresponds to the second example I've just shown. Let's investigate a single data point. We see that the node features X have a shape of 207 times 2 times 12. That means we have 207 sensors, each of them has two features, which are speed and time, and we have 12 graphs for each data points, or 12 measurements. Later in our recurrent model, we use these 12 measurements to feed them in as a sequence. On the other hand, we also have 12 labels, and those are 12 time steps into the future. So those are the 12 values we try to predict. These 12 labels are the normalized speed, so under the hood we perform node regression here. Because the speed labels were normalized, we cannot directly interpret them. However, if you're interested in doing so, the raw data can be found under this link and further information about the dataset can be found here. I wanted to mention that the shape we encounter here is not always the case. For some of the datasets, you might also need to loop over the data manually. The chickenpox dataset, for instance, consists of individual graphs and with the argument legs, you can specify how far in the future the labels should reach. Sometimes this is also called offset. So these temporal datasets can be confusing sometimes and if you get stuck, I can highly recommend to have a closer look into the source code. There you can directly see how the features and labels are constructed for a dataset. So these are two examples from the source code. One is for the chickenpox dataset loader and the other one for the Metro LA dataset loader. Here you can see, so this would be a classical predict next time step dataset because as features you use this range, so from i to i plus self dot legs. And then one additional index is the target. So you always have this delay uh, to predict the next time step. For Metro LA, we basically have a sequence to sequence prediction data set. That means we have a sequence of observations and we want to predict a sequence of labels. In our example, we had 12 as num time steps in as well as 12 as num time steps out. That makes 24 in total. And the first 12 are basically filled with the features and the remaining 12s are filled with the labels. And here you can see it in both cases indexes the same variable, which means that the speed labels are basically features for the old observations and labels for the new ones. Let's move on with our data set. We can of course visualize the target variable. So I take the target Y for sensor number one, because we have 207 sensors, so I visualize the first one, or actually a second one here, and I select a subset of the samples, in this case, the first 24 ones. So as this plot shows, there are some trends in the data. It seems that the traffic speed drops very low early in the morning and goes back up at noon. The y-axis is standardized and the labels can also include negative values here. Next we perform a simple test train split. This is straightforward. We simply split the data into 80% train data and 20% test data. And this can be done quite easily because 
within each of our samples we already have the sequences we need so we don't have to additionally iterate over the data this was already done in the pre-processing so we have these 12 historical features here and so because of that we can easily iterate over the samples in that data set now let's talk about the interesting part the temporal gnn more specifically, here I'm using an attention temporal graph convolutional network. This is based on the TGCN implementation, which consists of several graph convolutional layers, which are combined with a gated recurrent unit. As you can see, the actual model definition is very simple. And that is because PyTorch geometric temporal allows you to define such models on a very high level. Here we just create one of these a3 TGCN layers or blocks and that's it. The output can then just be used to get the predictions for the next 12 time steps and this can be done by saying or by using this periods argument which lets you specify how many periods you have. In this example we say 12. So in this forward block we call our temporal GNN and the return value of that is an embedding that we can use to get predictions for the next x time steps and here we say we want to get a single shot prediction for the next 12 time steps. When we print the model we can see that there are three graph convolutional layers. The output of these layers is used in a gated recurrent unit. So we can see the update gate set, the reset gate r and the new hidden state h. In each of these models, there is also a learnable transformation applied. I wanted to point out that I didn't find a way to further customize these blocks, which would be a big benefit. For instance, you would like to have deeper GNNs, so multiple layers, and here it's just a single layer, and I didn't find a way to do that. Of course, you can also check the source code and build such things by yourself, so basically to copy this class, but I think this is not how it should be. To get a better understanding of what happens here, I thought I'd bring up another diagram. We have these sequences of graphs that we use to predict a sequence of labels. This is one way to model this time series problem. In the first step, we take our current node features for the whole graph and the historical information that we've gathered so far. At this point, there is no historical information, so we pass in none. We input both into the temporal GNN model that will perform spatial and temporal aggregation. Internally, none is usually treated as zero vector. The output of this is a new embedding which holds the temporal and spatial information. In the next step, we get a new set of node features and together with the newly created embedding, we pass it into the model, so that would be the second iteration of this sequence. This output state H again contains the temporal and spatial features. As you probably guess, this process goes on for as many sequence elements we have. In the graph sketch on the top we have three steps, so we will do three iterations here as well. This final hidden state is then used to predict the next three labels. This model design is called single shot model because we output multiple values at once based on one single embedding. An alternative way is to use the hidden state after each iteration to get the model prediction. This is typically called autoregressive. Final remark, this also allows to implement stateful models which are able to model long-term dependencies on infinite long sequences. So far we only had a look at models that had a fixed size historical sequence. The A3 TGCN block that is used in this notebook is designed for single shot predictions because it does this aggregation over the sequence automatically. By passing in the periods argument we can automatically obtain the embedding for the whole sequence. This is quite suitable for our data set. Some of the layers in the library, however, are designed in an autoregressive way. This means you pass them a hidden state of the previous iteration. 
These were the most important things. The rest of the notebook is relatively easy. For 10 epochs, we trained the model using the mean squared error as error metric. And for me, it didn't make a big difference between GPU and CPU training. However, I ran into some memory bottlenecks and that's why I just trained on the first 2000 samples of the train data set. So as you can see, the loss is decreasing and it's printed after each of the epochs. And I do an early stopping here to not exceed the memory limits. In order to evaluate the model, I calculated the test MSE on the first 288 samples. That corresponds to the first 24 hours of the test data. To further analyze the predictions, I created some simple visualizations. So I selected a specific sensor and a specific time step within that window of 12 time steps. And I printed the predictions versus the labels. Let's face it, this model is not great yet. And the reason for this is that I didn't invest any time into the model tuning. And because this is the fun part of machine learning, I leave this open for you to experiment with this notebook. So that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I also hope that it was helpful in some way. And with that, have a great day and see you soon in the next video.